Does that mean that we're supposed to start? I don't know. Hi, Melissa. Welcome, Julian. Go ahead, get us started. Okay, thanks. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to our session. I'm Melissa Thomason. I'm the Associate Dean of the Farmer School of Business at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And I'm pleased to be the moderator of this session and introduce my colleague, Dr. Jillian Oakenfall, who's the factor, faculty director of diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion at the Farmer School. She's also a professor of marketing and the director, um, the, fa the founding director for the Center of Kick Glass Change. And what she's doing for us is something that that kind of is a it stems out of the Center for Kick Glass Change, and she is coordinating our efforts to educate our students in what we call CQ or cultural intelligence. And she's gonna talk about that, but it's essentially um, helping them to develop the ability to adapt and function in situations and environments characterized by cultural diversity. And she's uh, led the efforts to develop CQ in our unique first year integrated core. And we're now working on threading it throughout the curriculum. So without further ado, let me introduce Jillian. Great, thank you, Melissa. Uh, so I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to share what we're doing in the farmer school with you today. Um, I am a marketer. I'm gonna do a little bit of bait and switch to start off with, because what I'm gonna do is, is to actually make sure, first of all, that I contextualize what we're doing with culture, cultural intelligence. So what I'd like to do, first of all, is just give you our, our sense of, of um, how we define diversity, most particularly how we define it to our students. So as Melissa said, my focus is on really the education around diversity, equity and inclusion within the business school. And we have another um, director who focuses on, on uh, recruitment and retention. My belief is that we have to build it before they come. So the stronger I can make this program, the more attractive I believe a farmer school will be to those underrepresented students as well. So what I'm going to do is, is to take you through um, how we define diversity, equity, and inclusion, what our goals were with this program, and really show you how we are doing it programmatically, um, starting, as Melissa said, in our first year integrated core, um, and then starting to take it up through uh, the rest of the curriculum. So if you don't mind, I know we've all had much of this over the last year, I'm going to share screen uh, and just use some slides to anchor what I'm saying as I'm going through. Um, also, if you have any questions that you feel you really need to understand what I'm saying, um, pop them in the chat. Melissa will, will take a look at that. If there are others that you want to hold on to the end, I'm happy to, to then talk about maybe how, how this would be different for yours or anything about this that, that you need to understand. Um, but if I can keep going during it, that would be helpful um, so we can keep it moving and then address um, questions. But there's, if there's something that just is, is mind boggling to you, pop it in the chat and I'll off. Okay, can everybody see my, my slides? Yeah. Okay, um, so the first thing that's probably important to, to think about here is, is how we actually define diversity, equity, and inclusion. So everybody has a different version of this. Um, and so what we want to think about, what we talk to our students is diversity is a mix. It's a mix of all types of people. That's really what diversity is. And then equity and inclusion, equity is giving people what they need. So we talk about the difference between equality and equity. Um, and within that, then we start to talk about different types of diversity um, and, and making sure that different people get what they need as they're going in. And then the last part is inclusion, which is how do we make the mix work, right? So it's not just about bringing in a diverse workforce, it's giving people what they need in terms of having advancement and being happy in the workplace, feeling included, feeling belonging. Um, and so these are the three terms that we start with. Um, and I really think about diversity being the mix and equity and inclusion being the fix. You'll oftentimes also see or hear the word belonging in there as well, which is sort of going deeper into inclusion in terms of everybody being able to show up for work, be their authentic self at work, feel valued at work. So these are generally the terms that, that you will hear. Um, I have probably spent the last year now in different workshops around DEI. A lot of them were corporate workshops. Um, there were a lot of consultants now that are DEI. And what I found in that time was, A, it's a marketplace frenzy out there. And B, a lot of the things that people are doing aren't working. And a lot of people are checking boxes. And that is something that I felt very committed that I was not going to do. This for me is, is going to be my legacy at the Farmer School of Business. And what I did not want to do is anything that felt like, particularly to our students, 
and to our faculty that we were just checking boxes. That was not what I wanted to do. And so I really had to think about a, what would fit with our mix in the business school? And then how do we really uh, make this educational and really see that there is impact to what we're doing? So I said that diversity is the mix. And I really thought about the fact that how do we, how do we turn challenges into opportunities as we're going through this? So the first thing I wanna do is think about how do we design a program that fits our mix? That was what I was looking at, but I thought it would be helpful to start by getting a sense of what's the mix of everybody else who's in the room. So um, we are going to launch a poll. I've got actually three polls that are gonna launch that we're gonna launch now. And what I would like to just get a sense of from everybody um, who's here is what's the mix in your business school? So if we could launch the first poll, we have the first poll available. Jillian, I am so sorry. It's telling me that someone else is logged in. I'm wondering if my colleague Lisa is able to launch it. Oh, me. it's up. It's come from somewhere. Perfect. I'm just going to run with it. So the first one is, is asking you, uh, what percentage of your business school's undergraduate student body? And I'm going to focus primarily on undergraduate because that's what's, what's relevant to us here. Um, and I, I think if we, if we go outside that, it can, it can skew the results a little bit. So if you would just pop in there, what percentage of your business school's undergraduate student body uh, is male? Just wait for a few more people here. So again, if you're just coming in, we have about 60% of you participating. It'd be great if we just get everybody. So um, if you have a sense of what percentage of your undergrad student body is male, just pop it in there. Okay, I'm gonna assume nobody's digging for data. We'll just move on here. We'll end the poll and we'll go on uh, to the, to the um, to, well, I, can, we, can we possibly run all three polls and then share the results, is that possible? Let's just share the results of this. Just share the results of this one here. Okay, so what we're finding here is that uh, for most of the people we're here, we're looking at 40 to uh, between 40 and 60%. We're sort of split between 40 to 50% and 50 to 6%. A few are in the 60, 60s, uh, but most are in there between 40 and 50, which would, would mirror, if you think about the undergraduate population, it's um, slightly under 50% that would be, that would be male. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing this and ask you to, uh, to Put the second poll up, please. Now I'm going to ask you what percentage of your business school's undergraduate student body are white? Okay, so here we're looking what percentage are white? I'll just wait a couple more minutes. I mean, a couple more seconds. So we're looking at probably, uh, we got everybody who's in, okay. And it clearly doesn't have to be exact, just to get an idea here. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, so you should be able to see those. You'll see that, that we've got a few at 50 to 59, one below 40. Um, most are in the 70 to 79, so between 70 and 90%. So most of you are in, in business schools that are predominantly white. And then I have one more to ask you if we could run the third poll. So the last one is asking, what percentage of your business school's undergraduate student body are US nationals and residents? So we're looking here for the percentage that are not international students. Okay. 
And I guess I actually realize I'm a bit ethnocentric in my question because some of you are not in the US. Um, so I guess it should be really uh, the percentage that are domestic students in whichever country that you're in. Okay, I think we're around the same level. Um, so to share the results there, what you'll find is that, um, that the, most of you are at above 90% on that one. Some are 70, 80, some are much lower. I'm feeling that might be how I frame the question. Um, but, but most of you are actually close to where we are. Um, I would say in reality, we might be actually on the extremes of this compared to many of you. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I designed a program that fit with who we are. So I think one of the things about being a professor of marketing is I have a, a pretty strong idea of audience. I have a pretty strong idea of value creation. And so my goal is how do we create a program that has value to our students? Right? Not that I just dictate what they need, but how do I make sure I have a value proposition that they understand and they buy into? And so part of that has to be understanding the mix that we have. And so this is our mix. In the Farmer School of Business, this is our current class. You know, in the last year, there's been some, some obviously some things that are peculiar, but right now we are sitting on 64% uh, male and 36% female. And uh, that is driven in our business school primarily by two majors. Um, and we actually, I'm in a major that's prominently female, but we have some majors that are very, very male. And so that within the building is our mix, 64% male and 36% female. And this is white. Um, and so you'll see we are also very white, right? So over 80%, there's been a slight uptick in the last year, but that's got more to do with the loss of international students. And we've had grow growing enrollment. Our number of students in color in absolute terms has actually stayed relatively consistent. But again, we're around 80% white um, versus students of color and international students as we go through. And so as I was thinking about designing our program, I had to keep that in mind, 64% male, 84% white. Um, and I will tell you that when I first started talking to the faculty about these types of programs, um, our faculty wasn't that much different from this. And I got the same sort of disinterest when I would talk about DEI. Here is the woman standing up in front. Here is the gay woman standing up in front talking about diversity things because that's what they do. And I got just disinterest, really disinterest in terms of what we would do. We'd all sat through workshops um, and there was no enthusiasm for what I was doing. So I wanted to make sure that what I did was a program that really fit both our students and our faculty. I had to have a program that our faculty were also comfortable delivering. And so that, that's also in mind when, when we think about um, when we think about um, what the program should be. The second thing is um, I was tired of DEI being treated as a soft skill and it's still treated as a soft skill. At the very least, it's a human skill. It's not a soft skill. And one of the reasons why it's, it's discussed as a soft skill is because generally it's not measurable. And so I wanted to find a way that we could show both students their growth and faculty are the growth. And then systemically, we could see whether our programs were actually showing measurable impact. And so as I looked at this, I was looking for, can we get data around this, right? We are a business school, we have to have data, we have to have metrics to be able to show growth and to be able to show performance. And so that was another thing to have in mind here was a shifting the whole dialogue around this being a soft skill and then making sure that there was data to have, to have metrics for improvement as we're going through it. The last thing, was leveraging what we do do well. So the Farmer School of Business, it's not gonna be a surprise to anybody that we're not diverse. I take that as a positive in that there are gonna be low expectations that this is coming from the Farmer School. But the reality is we have bright, hardworking students and we do have that reputation. We have a skills-based curriculum that is really innovative that we have in our first year first year core. For, for 30 years, we have been leaders in the field of experiential learning, putting st students in actual client-based uh, situations. I'm taking a class to Spain and in January, they'll be working for a client in Spain. Um, we have been doing this for many years. And then we have very good partnerships, especially with our alum who go on to do great things. So that is one of the key things that I had. I knew that we had white male students, predominantly straight, but those students go on to do really good things. We have an, a, an enormous amount of CEOs, CMOs, CFOs, who are really high placed, who are really well connected to the farmer school. And what I wanted to try to think about is if we have that carrying on, these are our agents of change. 
If we can really instill this in these students who do go on to great things, then that's our opportunity. Then we also have to build programs for our underrepresented talent, especially in certain areas of business and technology. So thinking about all of this as a whole. So what we did is start, start with what we already had built. So we already had this first year program. The first year program was built around these skills. So this is a skills program that we started uh, five or six years ago. Um, and what we did is really look at the skills that our students needed in the workplace. We were hearing a lot of that time and still are about the employee skills gap that students were going out, this is not just us, everybody, going out with maybe technical knowledge, going out with, with area knowledge, but didn't have the key work skills that they needed. And so what we did is put in place um, an integrated core of four classes that are two work classes, each dedicated to different skills. And then the students do an, an experiential learning project at the end, 125 teams. So the idea is that if we're focusing on innovation, problem solving and decision making, what are the key skills that they need to do those well when they get out into the workforce? And so this semester, so we had critical thinking, ethical thinking, creative thinking, computational thinking and communication. What we did this year is add cultural intelligence as one of those key skills and it is now embedded in the deliverables of one of those courses. Um, within the course, as I said, 125 teams, they start collaborating uh, pretty early on and are in these cohorts as they go through it. And so cultural intelligence is coming up right from the get go in terms of adapting to difference. So we now have that in there as a key skill. We now have put our own feet to the fire because what we have to do now is ensure that we have we have a program after these three years, right? So after the first year that we have three years more of building these skills as we go in. So my focus is on the cultural intelligence as we go through. So this is what we are doing in our first year core. This is what we actually just finished doing in the first year program for the fall. And it's this mix. And I'm gonna take you through a little bit of what we do. So the first thing is, is introducing the idea of the mix and the fix. And we do this in a way where everybody in the room realizes that they are part of this. So when we talk about bias, we not only talk about bias against people of color, right? So we know about resumes where the name it seems reflective of somebody who is of color, getting um, callbacks more often than uh, getting less callbacks than somebody who has a white sounding name. And um, we know things about women in business, but then we start to tell them about things like bias against men who were less, who were, uh, less than five feet nine tall. Right? We talk about the average height of a CEO and all of a sudden you see them snap around and all of a sudden they're in the game. Um, and we're trying to build this case. Um, we have students who clearly who have disabilities, right? So it's not just about gender. It's not just about race. It's about difference, right? And it's how we deal with difference as we're going through there. So we talk about the mix and we talk about the fix. We then go on and start to lay tools that are appropriate for our students. And I'm gonna talk about each of these a little bit more in depth as we go through. So the first is before we talk about any type of identity diversity, we talk about cognitive diversity. So we introduce them to the idea of the brain and how we have different thinking preferences in our brain um, and how that creates difference. So we are not talking about it in any way where there are any triggers, any idea of power differentials, any idea of guilt. Um, we are starting with just this idea of difference and how if you are in the workplace with somebody or as a marketer in the marketplace, you have to be able to understand people who are different from you and have to be able to not just not go away from it, but actually embrace it and understand the benefit of it in business. And so cognitive diversity is a place for us to do that. And then the last thing, which is I know why you're here, is cultural intelligence. But it's important that you see, I think, the context for this within how we are, how we are building it with the students. So I'll take you through a little bit of what we do around the business case for DEI. So the first is we have to, we, you know, there's clearly a moral imperative to this, but we also very much in, um, try to to talk to them a lot about the influences of diversity on firm performance, right? So we're giving them data, we're showing them McKinsey reports, we're showing them data on um, the impact of having more diversity on CEO executive teams, um, looking at that on firm performance. So we're linking it in and, and recognizing where we need to get buy-in from students. So first of all, it just makes good business sense. Then we talk about a more expansive idea of diversity called 3D diversity, which I'll tell you about in a second. Um, so again, we're broadening this idea of what the mix really is. We explain equity and inclusion as the fix. 
And then we talk about three particular things, which are bias, psychological safety, and covering. Um, and these are again about how these show up in the workplace, how these show up in the marketplace, and clearly how they're showing up in society. So we're bringing all of these things into them. And then our application, they actually have to solve some DEI problems in business. Um, so they're doing that actually this week and they've given a, a list of problems. They're, they're clearly, we know there are many that they can approach. They're doing this in their teams. So again, they're starting to work with their teams. They get to pick their challenge and they have to come up with, with actionable solutions to the challenge. They also have discussions around this. And then at the end of the semester, they're put into this competitive uh, client project, which usually actually end up um, looking at diversity in some way. So they have to look at a diverse group of customers, these types of things. It's not necessarily something that we ask, but it's what, cost, it's what our clients are looking for. So generally, there has been that component in these client projects over the last year. So the first thing I mentioned is 3D diversity, and this is getting away from just being demographic diversity. This is, this is also partly because if we don't have that much demographic diversity, we need to be expansive in how we're thinking about it. And the key to all of this is that we're not actually looking for demographic diversity in companies, we're looking for cognitive diversity, right? We're looking for diversity of thought. That's actually what leads to better innovation, to better problem solving, to better decision making. It's having different ideas in the room, different perspectives in the room. And so this 3D model expands the idea of diversity to demographic diversity and experiential diversity, which gets us to more to cultural diversity. This idea of the experiences you've had in your life. And I think there you can see where we get into things like perspective taking, empathy. So that's where we're bringing this in. So we think of these as being a connected 3D model, really. And this is what we talk to them about. So we're really expanding their idea of what difference is, where difference can come from, and what type of difference is really valuable in the workplace. Once we've done that, we talk about the fact that Diversity in itself can actually be a recipe for disaster. And I'm sure we've all read plenty of case studies where it has been. And so diversity in itself needs a fix. So that's where we bring in some of the things we're talking about. And so this is a chart that, that is a pretty simple chart. So we talk about diverse teams. And, and I'm sure this is not new to anybody in the idea that a, a diverse team has to be well managed in order for it to have better performance. Right. So equity and inclusion are, are some of the things clearly those types of policies are about that management. If you have those in place, then you will have productive diversity of thought. But if you don't, you're actually better with a homogenous team. Right. Because otherwise, what you have is all of that diversity and you also have all of the bias that that's built into that. You have lack of psychological safety. You have things like covering. You know, we hear a lot about bringing your authentic self to, to work. Well, covering is when you don't. Covering is when you're recognizing where there is bias and where you may need to cover some different aspects of your life in different ways. And so that is why we have unproductive diversity of thought. And so that's why we don't stop with diversity as we're talking through here. So again, they are, they are working in teams at this time, right? They are dealing with already difference within their teams as they're getting this. So we're starting to build that in as we're going through. So we talk a little bit about structural bias and I don't want this to be a diversity lecture, but just having them understand that there is institutional bias um, that's historical, cultural and institutional. So we give them examples of that. And then we talk about individual bias or implicit bias. So it's important that they understand both of these when they go into business, they're going to have to hopefully try to reconstruct that, that structural bias, but then also understanding the bias that's existent in them. And that's really where we go off from here. Psychological safety is the belief that your environment is safe from interpersonal risk taking. They do a lot of work with Amy Edmondson's work on teaming from, from Harvard Business School. So understanding again, how this can affect when you don't feel safe. And these are all first years. Most of them don't feel safe. They are in, they're in a whole new environment, right? Everything embarrasses them. You put their picture up on the screen and they're mortified, right? They're already feeling this. So if they then feel like they're less than somebody else, um, they're going to feel even more unsafe. So again, it's making them understand this as we're going through. And the last thing is covering. And, and this one is really revelatory. We have them watch a video on this and it talks about all the different types of covering. 
and they may well be covering themselves. And it talks about all the different ways you may be covering some element of your identity, some element of your appearance, some element of your affiliation with certain groups. You maybe don't speak up on behalf of a group that you normally would as you're going through there. You don't disclose your associations with different people. Right. Um, I get asked all the time. I'm not sure why I've never asked somebody else. When I meet somebody for some reason, they ask me, what does my husband do? I don't think I've ever asked somebody what their spouse does. I get asked it all the time. I'm sure it's because I'm a woman. But for me, then it means I then have to either answer with the they pronoun for my wife or I have to say, oh, it's my wife. I'm 55 years old. I don't care. I say it's my wife. And then I have to wait for them to recover because they will. They'll either feel bad or they'll be shocked. Um, and so I have a choice. And for many years, I covered. I didn't answer that question. Not when I had a wife, but before that. Um, and that, that's this idea of when the, uh, when the environment is psychologically unsafe, this is one of the things that come from it. So we talk about these with our students. And I think it's actually a great relief for them because they're all trying to navigate this new environment. They are all trying to navigate what does show up for them and what doesn't as they manage this whole new place that they're in. So then it's done with the learning. And we talk about the fact that you must know yourself to grow yourself. So this work has to start with self-awareness. Um, and so we usually use uh, two tools. So we talk about biases. Again, we talk about it in a way where it is the reality that everybody has bias, right? These are psychological shortcuts. If you talk about all of the different messages and clutter that they experience in their lives, what we do is we organize these and we take mental shortcuts. That's how we manage bias. The key is not to somehow stop being biased because that's not ever going to happen. The key is understanding that you have bias, being aware of it, identifying what the bias is, and then being able to mitigate it or manage it. Right, so that's what we're talking about with them. So again, this idea that because you have a certain identity, because you maybe aren't American, because you somehow think of yourself as diverse, that you don't have this work to do, you absolutely do. You have the same, you have maybe have biases towards different things, but you have biases. Another thing that they need to recognize is that as human beings, social psychologists will say that what we basically do is anybody that we do not know, we treat as being part of our outgroup. That is our default. Our default is to outgroup. And it is only when we get to know somebody that we start to maybe consider them to be in our in-group, right? So again, these are biases that are all built in. It's just how the human brain works as we're going through this. So just laying this out again as non-judgmental, recognizing that everybody has this work to do as we're going through. Um, and then this is, you know, Dan Daniel Kahneman's work. And this really is the whole pathway to what we try to do with them. This idea that um, you have these mental processes that are happening, they are implicit, they are unconscious. And if you default to your system one thinking, they will raise their ugly head, right? So if we go with intuitive thinking, if we constantly put ourselves in situations where we are making fast, quick decisions, taking shortcuts, then that bias will be uh, able to manifest itself and grow. So what we have to do are put processes in place and cultural intelligence is one of them, where we switch to our system two thinking or our slow thinking and our rational thinking. And so what we are doing there are making conscious, deliberate decisions as we go through. So we are giving them with both of the tools I talked to you about, we have a four step process. Even with critical thinking, which is what we teach them in one of the courses, there's another four step process the 4S model from cracking the code. So we're giving them tools and we're giving them strategies. We're not simply saying, here you are, you've got to get to here. We're showing them a pathway to do it. We're giving them tools to doing it. We're giving them strategies, which again, is one of the very common critiques, criticisms of DEI work, is that you, you raise the problems, but there aren't solutions. So we're trying to make sure that those, that A, it's a solvable problem and that we're giving the tools to, to solve it as we're going through. Um, this one is one that when I talk to students about it, um, they get it, especially when you, you've probably just given them assignment and I ask them to think about what conditions that they put themselves in to, to complete the assignment. They probably all did it the night before or 10 minutes before it was due, right? So they're working under time pressure. We're all working under time pressure. Um, and I think working from home has only made this worse. Um, we're usually working under fatigue situations. Um, and then I asked them what kind of conditions were around them while they were doing their work. There are all sorts of distractions. They don't even try to 
think they need to keep away from them. And in these situations, again, it's fertile ground for bias. So again, making them realize, creating that awareness for them and making them realize that this is manageable, but you need to actively manage it as you're going through. I, I love this, uh, well, I love Shankar Vedantam of the hidden brain, but this is a, a statement of his, his voice is in my head as I read this, but he talks about extraordinary people. Good people are not those who lack flaws. The brave are not those who fear no fear. And the generous are not those who never feel selfish. Extraordinary people are not extraordinary because they are invulnerable to unconscious bias. They are extraordinary because they choose to do something about it. So the mandate that we try to set for our students is that we want them to choose to do something about it. And it's something that they all need to do as we're going through here. So when we talk about our fixes, we have two. So the first is going back to that idea of cognitive diversity. And we use HPDI, the Herman Brain uh, Dominance Model. So, um, and the second thing that we use is cultural intelligence. Within each of these, there is a four step process that you can use. So the first one here is the whole brain thinking. And, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. Um, it's, it's similar to uh, other tools, DISC is similar to it, but as with any tool, it's not about whether you hand me a hammer, it's whether I know what to do with it, right? It's the same with this. So we give them the tool, but then it's on us to make sure we show them how this can be used. And this is actually a, a favorite tool of mine. So it's not just about them understanding what their thinking preference is, which, which is what this is. It's then showing the work that they need to do with this. And so what this does is it, it takes a metaphorical four quadrant uh, idea of the brain. The idea that your brain functions can be split into these four. So it's not a literal four quadrant brain, but it does build from scientific research. And the idea that we basically have thinking preferences that go into these four different types of the brain. The, the, um, the yellow here is the why. Um, so it's the holistic, experiential, and you tend to synergize. It can also be creative. So you've got two different types of yellow there. The blue is the logical, analytical based, very fact based, quantitative. The green is more planning, organized, sequential. And the red is interpersonal, your people skills. Most academic researchers tend to fall on the blue green. I've done quite a few of these. Um, which makes you think about the need to stretch to red to be a good teacher. Uh, but most researchers who, you know, who are fans of the scientific met method will be here. Um, so the idea here is this is your base case. This is where your, your brain tends to default to. This is where you get energy from. And what we need to get our students to realize is that in order to be successful in business, they have to be whole brain thinkers. They have to be able to stretch. So for this person here, they're very high red. They need to be able to stretch into especially green and into blue. The other thing that this does, and it's not up here, is it shows them how their thinking preferences change under stress. And it can be quite shocking and very revelatory for people in terms of how their thinking preferences change enormously when they're under stress. And most of the time for our students and for all of us, we're always under stress. We're waiting for the last minute, we're distracted. And so this is actually not indicative of how we're actually working. So now what we are trying to get them think about is not only just self-awareness, but what does this mean when I'm working with somebody who's different from me? So for example, the yellow, the why, tends to be oppositional to the green, the how. And so you will find that people who are strong yellows will be a little bit oppositional in terms of how they want to work with somebody who is, who is uh, a high green. The yellow wants to think about the why. They're fine with all these gaps, right? They want to visualize it. The green wants to know feasibility, implementation. How are we going to do this? And so you may think that somebody is being deliberately obstructive. You may think they're trying to be psychologically unsafe when in reality it's about just understanding somebody else's perspective, understanding how they are wired and understanding the why of what people are doing. That is adapting to difference. We also talk about the fact that there is bias, right? If you think about the in-group, out-group, we will all tend to prefer people who think just like us, right? As much as it's not valued, we'll, we'll have that. And so it's, again, what we try to do when we have teams is we actually give them their, their group HPDI and we ask them to look at the diversity in the team to try and predict how this might cause some dysfunction and to put together a working map so that they are avoiding that. If you're somebody who's high green, you cannot be doing deadlines late at night. They're gonna be stressed, right? Um, somebody who's yellow is going to need to be organized. 
as we're going through. So we try to get them to have that self-awareness that they understand the differences that are in the team and they learn how to not just manage them, but actually embrace them as we're going in. The second one is the one that I promised in the title, which is cultural intelligence. Um, and this is taking a really different look at culture. This is actually, um, a, full disclosure, this is a scale that was actually developed for multicultural markets, uh, for multicultural um, really business, but in psychology. So it's a fully, it's a full psychometric scale, but really was developed early on around working with people who are from different national cultures, right? So how would I work with somebody from India? Um, and so the, the researchers at the time identified four dimensions that really predict how well somebody will operate in a cultural, culturally diverse environment. So the four that they came up with were motivation, um, cognition, metacognition, and behavior. Those were the four. And then this got commercialized a little bit, um, as things do. And so those four dimensions are now called CQ drive, which is motivation, CQ knowledge, which is your cognition, CQ strategy, which again is metacognition, and CQ action, which is your behavior. And so what this really is, is it, it's a measure of somebody's individual, of their ability to adapt and function effectively in different cultural environments and in situations that are characterized by cultural diversity. Now, where this took a turn over the last five years is it was looked at whether it could be valid for, for domestic cultures as well. And in fact, it was found that it could be. And that's, this is mostly how we use it. I'm about to take a group to Spain, and so I'm actually using it still for multicultural, for international. But generally, when we use it in the first year program, we use it and we ask them to think about when they assess themselves, we ask them to think about domestic culture within the US. So we have them do a self-assessment at the very beginning of this, and they see what their baseline is. This is a, a statement by Julia Middleton. She did run a, a charitable organization in the UK called Common Purpose. Um, and she says, culturally intelligent people understand what makes their own culture unique, how it influences their way of seeing the world, and how it can impact the way they judge and interact with people who are different. She makes a really fine, I think this is a really great point, that you have IQ, you have EQ, and you have CQ. She talks about the fact that EQ is how, about you, how well you work with other people. CQ is how well you work with people who are different from you. And that is a key skill. Right? And when we've talked about collaboration in other ways, when we've done this, we've really focused more on the EQ. How do you work with other people? But if we can now bring the difference to the forefront, be aware of it, manage it, and then embrace it, then that's a very different skill. So the thing that has changed here is when we talk about culture, we are talking about any difference. So culture, and I think any of you who are of a certain age will agree with this, can definitely be age. Right, so I joke, my kids are, you know, they say, okay, boomer all the time. Okay, boomer, pick up your pants. Okay, boomer, right? I'm not actually a boomer, but um, you know, they can't say that in the workplace. I could well be still in the workplace when they join the workplace. They need to know how to interact with a boomer. They need to understand what my values are, right? They need to know how to adapt to, to my lens. And that's what we're looking at here. It can be sexual orientation. It can be all types of identity. It can be race. It can be national origin. It can be a marketer talking to an accountant. And anybody who's done that knows that we see things differently, right? So anytime you are going into a situation that's characterized by difference, then you can use this process as we're going through. So the way we start with the students is we talk about the fact that, again, if you put this process in place, you are going to slow down your thinking. And that unconscious bias becomes conscious bias. At that point in time, you have a decision to make then as to whether you want to interrupt the bias or mitigate the bias, but you'll be aware of it as you're going through it. So this is what we do with our first years. We actually have them take, and we have done this over the last two weeks. Um, so after they have taken the modules on the business case for DEI, after they have done their work on cognitive diversity, so we've built in this idea of difference, we then bring it back to them and we ask them to assess their CQ. Now, this is like brushing your teeth, right? You can cheat on it, but it's going to hurt you. It's a self-assessment. So we try to get them to really think developmentally here and to be very honest in how to assess themselves. We ask them when they do their assessment to, um, to measure it against their peers. So they are assessing themselves against their peers. So they will take an assessment that measures the four different dimensions 
Then we give them a module where they learn about CQ. So what I was talking about, IQ, EQ, CQ, we have them talk about, we have them learn about that. We have them take some quizzes and they do uh, a discussion board around this where they have to do critical thinking. So another skill in the same course. So they're, they're reflecting on what they, what they have found in the reading. Then we ask them to go into their report, their individual report and do a self-reflection. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And start to think about areas of improvement. Then the last part of this is we make them put a plan together. These are first years. For a start, it also has the process of introducing them to what's available to them at the university, right? So it also has that benefit to them. So we've put together this website um, and they, there are resources here. So the first one, the Beyond Ready CQ in the Farmer School is really taking a lot of programs that already existed. So our study abroad, um, we had a, a global readiness certificate. We have a, a, they are required to take a diversity course as part of our business core, but it puts everything together for them. If there are courses that are focused on CQ. So they go into this Beyond Ready CQ in the FSB and everything that the Farmer School can offer them to help them improve their CQ is available to them there. The next thing is a center, I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, but it's a new center that we have where they can take co-credentials and there are leadership programs that they can also do outside of the classroom uh, to, to help them develop their CQ. We then went through and looked at every minor, every thematic sequence, every certificate that was available at Miami University and put them in this list. So anything that they can do within their normal coursework, right? So this is an extra, where they can be picking up their CQ as they're going through. So again, showing them where by the choices they make, they will develop their CQ. Student orgs, we have apparently over 700 in the, in the business in, the, in Miami University, over 200 of them, give them different opportunities to uh, improve their CQ. Now they have to choose them based on what their differences are. Right. So, for example, Boys and Girls Club of America is in there. If you are somebody who's low E SES, that may not be a difference for you. If you are somebody who's come from wealth, then you're likely to be working with people in, if you think about the rural area where we are in Oxford, with people who are of lower socioeconomic status. So, again, opportunities for you to constantly be uh, dealing with difference, working with difference, adapting to difference. Uh, we also have uh, resources available to them. This year, we're actually starting off actually an HBCU as student exchange with uh, Florida a &M. So that's another opportunity for them to actually go through, through this program as well. So we have our first years look at all these resources and put together a plan. And then they get uh, scored on it. I'm gonna move a little quicker through this. These are the metrics. So this is the aggregates for last year. So this was our pilot, actually. We did it in another course. And what you'll see immediately on one semester, we had this growth. And this was actually a less comprehensive plan than what we did this year. Um, but you'll see on each dimension, they came in high on drive, which is our motivation, but we moved it up again. Knowledge was lower, we're moving it up. So this is the, the dark gray are moderate. Um, we want them clearly up here in the orange. Um, most people come in lower on strategy, they're moving up, but look at action. They now feel like when they are in culturally diverse situations, they know how to adapt. That's an enormous thing, right? So what they are seeing, and this is aggregate level, what they're seeing is that just from the work they did in this course, they're seeing growth, right? So it gives them the stimulus to now go on um, and look more um, over the four years. This is something we piloted this year. One of the things that I like to do is what else is going on around the university that, that we can find. So one of our BUS 101 faculty had the idea of trying this. It worked out really well, right? So it's a four hour program through our outdoor pursuits where they do um, collaborative problem solving on the ground and they go all the way up to where they're in the air. I'll give you a quick example of a case where one team had a student who had a physical deformity on his face. He was born with a tumor um, that he'd had to have removed. Uh, and that tumor still affected his balance and you could still see it on his face. He was a type of student who typically in any university would probably be considered on the fringes. In this team, he was already in his team. They saw the challenges that he had with his balance down here on the ground, right? They experienced it with him. So they were getting perspective taking. When they got to do more difficult things, he was getting so frustrated with them that he told his team, just carry on without me. Not one of those students would carry on without him. Not one, right? Not one. And so when they get back in the classroom on Monday, they have a whole different perspective on that student, 
they have a whole different empathy for that student and it's already brought them together in terms of overcoming their own biases and working more effectively collaboratively. We are hoping, um, it would depend on funding and other things, but what we would like to do is see if we can scale this and actually bring it in for all of our students next semester as we're going through it. Um, the next part is, uh, it's no good if this just is in the first year core. So the other part of this is we have to get it out of there. So we have to build off of it. So our, for our advising staff, we have a professional advising staff that meet with our students. We have a training session with them in December. Our hope is that students will bring their plan to them when they have an advising session. The advisor will say, how are you doing? Where are you in it? Do you need to update it? Are you struggling with it? But there is now somebody there pacing them at least, and at least giving them, holding their feet to the fire a little bit and saying, where are you on your plan? So we're trying to build that in. Um, we will build that in. The harder part, I think, let's be real, is faculty. So we're also doing faculty training and we're starting this by simply making them aware of what the students are getting. So we're starting um, in winter term and in spring term where we will offer them basically the same material that we give our students. Right? So at the very least, they understand what the students have got. They understand what the students are coming out with. So that they now, if they have the motivation to do it, can build on it. The second part of it for me as the director of the Class, Center for Kid Class Change is to give them the support that they need. Right? A lot of people have fear about dealing with diversity and that fear often leads to inertia. What we want to do is A, show that these skills, there's the opportunity for these to show up in our second year core and in the majors, but also that we have culturally intelligent classrooms, right? So that we have faculty who are also able to adapt to difference and embrace difference as we're going through it. Um, we have a couple of courses that have already started. These are in, man these are in marketing. We want this to be happening everywhere. Right? So we, we want this to be showing up so that when a student who is an accountancy student comes out, they start to now see how CQ is needed in, in accountancy and, and it's needed everywhere, right? But they need to get the flavor that they need in their technical areas as you're going through it. So I'm focused very much on the marketplace when we're talking about marketing, right? Clearly each discipline needs to have its own um, activation of, of cultural intelligence within the major. Um, so the last part of this is, um, is the Center for Kick Glass Change. So this is an effort to really bring this into the forefront as more of a co-curricular opportunity and as a leadership program. This is brand new. This really came out of the idea of um, not just diversity, but social change last summer. When there was the uprising around racial injustice, it was just time. And, and I knew when this was launched, it wouldn't be perfect, but nothing will ever get launched if you wait for it to be perfect. And so we are adapting this as we go. I had a learning last week when I thought all these students would sign up for credentials for next year and they did not. And so it's like, okay, they're overwhelmed in the first year. It can happen there. So we're looking at, at how to roll this out. But the mission is to enhance cultural intelligence. We've started that in the first year, but it needs to build on. Um, to then also have a program for underrepresented talent. And so that is uh, students of color, women in certain disciplines, LGBTQ, uh, students with physical disabilities. So again, keeping that broad mix, but recognizing that some people are going to have to kick glass, right? So are we preparing them to do that? Are we giving them the opportunity? Are we creating that equity that is needed, right? Giving everybody what they need. The last one is really that focus on who we really do have in the building those white males who are going to go on to do great things. Can we turn them into CQ leaders? Can we make them agents of change? It won't be everybody, right? But can we put that in them? Can we instill that in them when they do go into the workforce? And we know that this generation is very different from others. They are looking for this kind of work. So this is actually the programs that happen within the, within the Center for Kick Glass Change. To some extent, it's the engine for a lot of other things. So the funding that goes along with those assessments came from a grant that the, the Center for Kick Glass Change got, right? The, the donor money that we're going to need to continue it, it's coming through the Center for Kick Glass Change. And the Kick Glass Leadership Program will be run by the Center for Kick Glass Change. So being a resource for faculty, that will be the center for kick glass change so that there is somebody there, something there, resources there for faculty who want to do this work. That has to be there institutionally. Glass Kickers is the, um, is the advancing underrepresented talent program. Um, organizational security will be the training that we're doing of, of staff and then researching cases. 
if any of you have tried to do anything in, in your classes with around CQ, around diversity, there is a paucity of, of cases, really good quality cases to draw from. We'd like to really be pushing that out as well. That will be a second, third year goal, but that's where we'd like to be. So I've mentioned uh, some of our resources. This is something that we have. I will admit to you as a marketer that I understand the value of sizzle. You have to have steak, but you have to have sizzle. We um, got a grant to do a DEI VR simulations. So this would be a white user who goes into a simulation and becomes a black woman and goes through a workplace scenario where they get to experience the bias that a black woman would experience in that situation. You switch to a different simulation and they get to be a bystander to that woman and they start to check their own bias. It's only five minutes. But this, when I showed this in our faculty farm, in our faculty meeting, all of a sudden, everybody was excited. Maybe it's sizzle, but everybody was excited. And what we have now built onto this is a workshop that will take an hour after that. But now we have something to draw on, right? We've gotten people interested and then we can dig deeper. And these simulations are, they're a little basic. I would say I'd like them to go deeper, but we can go deeper in the workshop if we start to really think about this. So, so I have my marketer's eye on this as well in terms of what you need to bring people in. Intergroup dialogues is another thing that we already had at the university that we're now bringing in as uh, students in our capstone courses in marketing take this as part of the course. We wanna scale this out, right? It's no good having 40 students take this. We want every student who wants to take it to be able to take it. And we want funding to be able to do it as we're going through it. So these are our, this is our CQ leadership program. This is building the bicycle as they, uh, as we ride it, as they come, feels like I'm building the bridge as they take the next step. So this is what they've just done. Our first years have done CQ Drive. Um, the idea would be that we would build out this leadership program for this first year cohort. Um, and you will see these map onto the four dimensions of CQ. And um, the goal would be that we are preparing them, right? So that we don't send them out to uh, action or behavior before we've built the model, right? Before we've given them the motivation, before we've gil given them the knowledge that they need, before we give them the ability to plan ahead and then they go, right? That's the idea of this as we're going through. So there's a lot of perspective taking that goes on under CQ knowledge. Then we're starting to actually use it, apply it, start to think about how we strategize. And then lastly, we're in the field. Right, so that's where you have the, C the HBCU exchange, global leadership experiences, uh, building on some of our own um, immersion programs, our own experiential learning, actually getting people on the field as we go through it. My, my learning this week is that my, my thinking was I would start offering these as a la carte. Um, I think it has to be the opposite where we create a leadership cohort to go through this and then we start to offer it a la carte. I think not every student is gonna just opt into this in the first year as we're going through. And that's the adaptation that has to happen. Uh, this is the Glass Kickers program, again, building on the programs that we already have, different from other programs and that I think there needs to be preparation before you start anything. We have, uh, I'll take the women that we have, a lot of them come from high performing women's schools, girls' schools, who haven't actually had to deal with breaking down barriers and who aren't aware of what the workplace will be for them when they get out. We need to not only make them aware, but give them the strategies, right? So that they're prepared for it. And um, we need to give them opportunities and we need to give them scholarships to have some of these leadership um, opportunities as we're going through. So a lot of this will be creating the programs and then scholarships to do the work as we're going through it. And I said at the top, this is not Field of Dreams. I don't think they're gonna come until we build it. Um, and so for me, this is about building something, having a competitive advantage, having those high performing underrepresented students come in and really take advantage of the program that we've built. Um, and that is it. So what I tried to do is really present this to you very programmatically. Um, hopefully I gave you a sense of the thinking behind it, how we are rolling it out. It is new um, with, with definitely areas of growth. Um, and also pretty entrepreneurial in that, you know, if a new partner comes in and there are new opportunities, then we'll shift and we'll start to be agile in that way as well. Um, so now I'd, I'd love to, Melissa, if we, we have any questions that, um, that anybody would like yeah. to answer. You did such a terrific job that there were some enthusiastic responses in chat and a question on whether this would be available afterwards, but no questions so far. So I think we can just open up the floor and go ahead and take questions. If, if people want to put it in chat or raise their virtual hands, that'd be terrific. 
I put in a question, Jillian, in regards to faculty training, if it's been started, how it's going, what, if there's pushback, how are you prepared to handle that? Uh, so we started, it was a bit of a stop and start because we had COVID, right? So we were starting this and we had a great session the January. So we have a winter term, which is a lovely opportunity to do some of these trainings. So we had a CQ strategies to, uh, to, to create a culturally intelligent classroom. And we had a faculty workshop and we, we took them through um, their own self, their own self assessment, and then how this plays out in the classroom. It was really well received. I mean, for a group of faculty, I have to say I was astonished with how high, um, how highly acclaimed it was. They're normally a little chintzier than that. And the plan was let's build, and then COVID hit, shut down, um, and you know everybody was just just hanging on, right? With doing the shift to remote, um, you know the VR. I've had it for a year now, but we couldn't put VR glasses on anybody, right? As we're going through there. Um, but also then that allowed me to sort of switch tack and say, well, let's roll this out with the students. Let's show it. And then let's start by showing them what the students are getting. Because I think that's actually a, an easier access point than going in there and saying, here's how you need to improve, right? So we're starting off by simply saying, here's, here's what the students are getting. No judgment, right? But building their drive, right? Building their CQ drive in terms of saying, right, let's build on this. And while it probably won't be everybody, the hope will be, okay, let's work with you, right? And I'm not going to walk in and say, here's how CQ shows up in finance, but I can certainly help you with that. I can certainly look at, here are our second year programs. You know, we can't go just deaf on this when they get to the next level. So how are we talking about this? I have one of the more easier disciplines, clearly marketing, but we're not doing it right now. We're looking at how does it need to be in our second year courses? So I need to have faculty who want to hear me talk about this and who are then willing to do that, right? So the buy-in really is our students are coming and we've given them this. You know, we, I hope everybody feels we have a responsibility to build on this. I also hope everybody realizes what a competitive advantage this is. I mean, I, I was talking to my class that I'm taking to Spain. Um, I was talking to them on Tuesday. Half of my class are finance majors. I'm teaching a marketing capstone. Hardest crowd to get to think about DEI. Finance majors and male, right? And marketing, so three, blah, 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 as you're going through there. And when you start putting it in the realm of self-interest, so here you are, you're at the farmer school. Nobody is going to expect you to have these skills. And it's going to be a problem for you that nobody thinks you have these skills. Here's what you can do, right? So um, here's, uh, I'll get off of share screen here too. Um, so here's what you'll have. You'll already have your credential. You'll have your learning, you have everything that you have in finance, but now you can also show them that you have done this work, right? And, and it's a more enormous competitive advantage for them. One of the things we're also doing is making sure that we're giving them credentials so that it doesn't just appear in a class. So our first year students actually get two credentials from that first year. So a digital credential from the center that they can put on LinkedIn, they can put in their resumes to show employers that they've done this work. So even if they're going for internships in their second or third year, they've got that up there, right? Um, you know, so everything we learn about, every discipline is moving towards analytics, towards technology, but there's a yin to that yang, which are the human skills, right? And so showing that we have whole brain thinkers who are coming out with both sides, I think that that's what this really is. Um, and I think it's short-sighted in any discipline not to realize that that's what we need to do. There's so many positive comments in the chat and I'm thinking, Scott, I wish you could franchise this. It'd be really cool. You've done this amazing work. Your slides are so pretty. Could we just buy the box <laughs> Yeah, with the glasses? Thank you, Jillian. Any other questions that anybody has? It's a typical Zoom meeting. It seemed like how every class ended last year. Everybody is either really happy or can't wait to get off. <laughs> um, well, I will, I will go to the networking area after this and I'll be at the Miami table. So if anybody would like to drop in there, I have time between now and a high school soccer game. I'm not playing it, my son is. Um, so uh, I will be happy to, to hang out there. And if anybody would like to, um, if anybody would like to join me there, I'd be happy to, to talk a little more about this. And join in Chrome. You have to join in the Chrome, not in Explorer or Firefox to join the networking lounge.